Now we can get back to our discussion in this panel about the history historiography of um, the consequences of uh, World War II. We will hear and see uh, Dr. Łukasz Kamiński, who is the uh, head of the uh, European Memory and Conscience uh, Platform, and he teaches at um, Wrocław University, former head of the Institute of National Remembrance. We will have uh, Peter Oliver Lev, who is a professor in Darmstadt and the head of the German Institute of Polish Affairs, and uh, Professor Alvidas Nygentaitis, who is the director of the Lithuanian Historical Institute in Vilnius. Uh, thank you very much for accepting our invitation. Now, gentlemen, I would begin by asking a fundamental uh, basic question. Was 1944-1945 for Central and Eastern Europe, uh, was it a liberation or a new occupation? This is a question I want to address to Dr. Łukasz Kamiński, first of all. Uh, the debate, uh, the court is still out. Uh, we can, uh, in this matter, we can rely on our, on our own opinions, but we can uh, say that adopting uh, the perspective of all of uh, Central Europe uh, uh, does complicate the uh, situation because in May 1945, our countries were not <coughs> all in the same situation. On the one hand, we have uh, Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia, which were occupied by being incorporated into the Soviet Union. On the other hand, we have uh, Czechoslovakia, which, as it seemed at the time, in May 1945, um, could enjoy a regained uh, democracy, restored democracy and freedom. Uh, another, we had another situation in Hungary and Romania, which uh, countries as allies of the Third Reich uh, were uh, formally occupied. Uh, and uh, another situation was uh, that of Poland. Consequently, we still lack a single uniform um, perspective on the situation. But um, it has to be said that even Polish historians uh, still don't agree, don't uh, have uh, uh, single position. We can say that in the 1980s, with the emergence of in, uh, independent uh, history and the um, same as that uh, history, uh, certain issues uh, such as the Katyn massacre and the invasion of Poland on September 17th by the Soviet Union. So questions whether we were liberated or subjected to a new occupation, uh, these uh, topics were not uh, broadly discussed. And uh, this uh, continued until the 1990s or through the 1990s, where Professor Christina Kirsten, um, a collection of essays about 1944 and 1956 uh, called it uh, between liberation and enslavement uh, with a question mark uh, without specifying what that period meant for Poland. This uh, changed after the establishment of the Institute of National Remembrance after new research uh, which um, um, produced uh, new facts, uh, which drew attention to new facts. And the discussion um, was uh, revived. And I went over the uh, recent overviews of uh, Polish uh, history, how this uh, period is described. And most authors, most of our colleagues uh, use uh, different uh, halfway terms, uh, territory taken over, uh, repelling Germany's uh, um, in, so it wasn't called liberation, but uh, it the the facts were not interpreted in term were not called occupation, which I personally believe uh, was the case at the time. And such discussions are still underway in uh, at least some other countries. It's worth uh, getting back to the example of the Czech Republic, where there is the very interesting uh, debate on May 1945 in Prague, who effectively liberated uh, Prague. Was it the uh, Prague uprising or whether it was the Red Army or whether it was
the Russian Liberation Army um, allied with uh, so the in terms of uh, historiography in terms of history uh, the question remains uh, open and as regards uh, Poland in 1945 I believe we should talk about a new occupation so professor Lev, uh, Lev how does this look from a German perspective <laughs> Well, with regard to your German neighbor, um, Germany is obviously a highly diverse territory. Uh, before we, ha we, were, we were split into three parts, the uh, former German ter ter territories to the e uh, west of, uh, to the east of the Oder and Neisse, and then we had the former USSR part, that is the later German Democratic Republic and what we now refer to as the Federal Ge Republic of Germany, which ultimately means that we have separate territories and uh, a number of groups oppressed, which means that liberation was magical for everybody, whether it was brought by East or West. Now, everybody involved in the terror of the, of the Nazis, uh, well, the end of the war was the end of that world. But as of the day of that liberation, in Gdańsk and uh, Wrocław, there could have uh, been national socialist Nazis who could go on operating, and these people were also liberated. And in all probability to these people, now, the end of the war brought the end of the world that these people knew, be it Breslau or Danzig. In all probability, these people had to be displaced, had to move to the West, and uh, these people, uh, to these people it was all the same, whether they had been liberated by uh, Berling, uh, or, or by Anders, which means that uh, we have to consider different perspectives. Now, the more we go to the, way, the West, the more person we, people we will find who are, were considering the end of the war as a liberation. They did not have to leave their homes or their social circumstances or so social surroundings. Now, the Nonetheless, the concept of liberation had not been truly popular. It might have been part of the German Democratic Republic discourse. Nonetheless, in the West, only uh, von Weizsäcker um, in 1985, when he spoke in the Bundestag, he actually did uh, did was the word liberation used for the first time officially. And uh, as of that day, as of that address, as of that intervention by von Weizsäcker, we had been pondering, we had been deliberating the end of the war in uh, liberation categories. Uh, it goes without saying that on the one hand, uh, yes, the uh, Germany had been the cause um, of the war. They had been the perpetrator of, of the war. Nonetheless, it can also be interpreted as an, um, it can be seen as the interpretation of a claim that we were also victims. Um, there is a discourse according to which Germans had also been part of uh, victims. Well, from the individual perspective, yes, indeed, many Germans had been the victims of World War uh, II. Either they fell at the front or they were killed uh, during um, bombings, during air raids, or they lost their property, their assets. And the sense of loss is most definitely something which had affected German historiography. historiography. German historians could not abstract uh, from ha what had happened before. They did lose a lot. Nonetheless, immediately after the, wor uh, the world, um, by, in works by Kokon and by Proshat and others, 
attempts were made to uh, describe the German fate in a scientific and technical way. Uh, it was said explicitly that the Germans were victims, but they were also perpetrators. They had caused the war. They had been the immediate reason behind all these atrocities. Most recently, in the early years of the millennium, uh, the discourse of Germans as victims had been more often referred to by historiographers. For example, in the context of the uh, Dresden air raids uh, in 1945, it is described uh, as an atrocity. Uh, many civilians had died, obviously. Uh, I would like uh, to uh, remind you of Günther Grass and um, Kripsgang, crab walking, um, which had also uh, triggered some discussions. Nonetheless, I believe that currently German historiography is walking away from that concept as well. Uh, yes, we do have a number of uh, notions which have been raised by current historiography and attempts have been made to analyze what had been going on throughout German territories during World War II, but also what was going on in occu on occupied territories. It is a multi-layered and multifaceted uh, landscape. Now, um, question to Professor Nishantaitis. Uh, Lithuania, uh, Latvia, and Estonia had been made part of the USSR. Uh, so do these countries consider 1945 to be a form of new occupation, or, do they ha or are there any difference in opinion? Uh, it's difficult to answer that uh, question. I mean, you could answer that, uh, provide a clear answer to that question. But what's interesting is uh, how this uh, conclusion was arrived at. If you look at uh, Lithuanian historiography, we can uh, speak of uh, the writings of Lithuanian uh, historians. We can't do that without taking into account the situation in the entire country. Because Lithuanian historians are live in their uh, communities and study those matters which are of interest to those uh, communities. And here I would like to draw your attention. I'd like to um, point out that Lithuania's uh, situation was a bit different than that of uh, Poland and Germany. And it was also uh, different than the uh, situation in Ukraine. One of the differences was mentioned by Professor Lukasz Kaminski. Who said that uh, whether the Baltic states were occupied or not occupied is a question we can talk about in terms of 1939 or 1945, 1944 and 1945, there's a difference here. And another difference stems from is has to do with uh, how Lithuanian society sees the work of historians and what it respects. It took a lot of time for Lithuanian uh, society as well as uh, historians to take an interest in World War II. And talking about the new beginnings of uh, Lithuanian historiography, we need to say that this subject matter uh, that of World War II and the Soviet Union, of which uh, Lithuania was a part until 1990, was a foundational myth, was, was something fundamental. And after the fall of communism, it was this history could uh, first be approached, addressed, investigated, and it became interesting. And so here, In Lithuania, uh, interest in World War II came perhaps from the outside, such as the involvement of Lithuanians in the Holocaust. 
and, and in the beginnings of independent Lithuania, uh, prior to the collapse of the Soviet Union, to the ultimate collapse, there was uh, an important uh, debate on the Hitler-Stalin pact and the uh, secret protocol to that pact. Uh, all I can say is that a breakthrough as applied to society and the work of historians came in 2005. The debate being whether President Adamkus uh, has to attend the uh, commemoration uh, ceremonies in, to, in Moscow organized by President Putin. And the Lithuanian uh, society and historians uh, started taking an interest, uh, started addressing the topic of whether it was an occupation or not. And it was this political discussion, or uh, not uh, in academic papers, and also historians started speaking about a war after the war, uh, the guerrilla warfare that began along with the second Soviet occupation. And uh, there was also an interesting discussion about the complicity of Lithuanians in the occupation of Lithuania or collaboration. There was a, a discussion in 2006 that began when, together with uh, Russian uh, historians, uh, someone who did a lot to uh, clear up, to uh, write about Katyn, there was uh, about the role of the Soviet Union in World War II. So the question was, when does occupation end and where does annexation uh, begin? This also referred, it also addressed the uh, participation of Lithuanians into the process of Sov Sovietization. So to uh, long story short, in society and among historians, uh, the question of whether it was or was not an occupation is not being asked, but um, there are a number of details that are interesting, and not just for historians, but also for the public generally. We have our fourth uh, panelist, uh, Professor Georgi Kasyanov uh, from the National Academy of uh, Science in Ukraine, who is a historian. And uh, we'd like to ask uh, the professor to say whether 1945 was a new occupation for Central and Eastern Europe or whether it was liberation for Ukraine. Was the passage of the Red Army up through Ukrainian lands, was it liberation? How is that seen in Ukraine today? Uh, as far as I understand, I may speak English. Yes, please. OK. So, uh, uh, well, in Ukraine, the commemoration of the Second World War until 2015 was a part of tradition which uh, was uh, formed, uh, which established itself in uh, Soviet times. And uh, according, according to one of uh, memorial laws from 2000, it was still called until 2015, a, uh, the uh, anniversary of the victory of the Great Patriotic War. In 2015, the uh, name of the celebration and the name of the date changed. And now it is called uh, the victory over uh, of Nazism in the Second World War. So uh, the Soviet uh, formulation uh, expired. And uh, it is now it's out of uh, the official vocabulary. Uh, um, and uh, then the interpretations of the event and of 1945 are still, um, let's say, contradictory. Uh, part of population still wants to talk about uh, a great patriotic war and a great victory. The official commemoration policy proposes two dates. One date is the 8th of May. It's a day of uh, memory, uh, remembering, and uh, uh, reconciliation. And 9th of May is a victory day, victory over Nazism. Uh, 
I, in terms of, uh, of interpretation of 1945, uh, so we still have different uh, approaches, different traditions. One of them is Soviet, it's a victory. And uh, Ukraine is a part of this great victory. Another tradition which uh, uh, presented itself quite uh, openly and energetically, I would say, uh, since 2015, is that Ukraine is a victim of uh, two totalitarian regimes. And in this case, the official politics mostly follows this line. So uh, under this line, of course, uh, the reappearance of Red Army uh, considered exactly like it's, it's considered and presented in Eastern European countries uh, as a uh, well new occupation. However, uh, a great portion of population does not support this. And of course, this also provokes uh, uh, reactions and uh, debates in professional historiography. Uh, generally, I must say that uh, 9th of May, the day of Vic Victory Day, uh, is still very popular uh, according to the ratings of popularity of uh, holidays. Uh, it is on the fourth place after New Year, 1st of January, after 7th of uh, January, Christmas, Orthodox Christmas, and after uh, 8th of March, uh, the International Women's Day. So it is still very popular and still majority of uh, respondents when they are asked about the uh, uh, commemoration celebrations still want to have 9th of May as a victory day. So uh, it is very different in very regions, expectedly in Eastern Ukraine, a majority of people want to celebrate Victory Day and in uh, Western, U uh, Western Ukraine, majority want to celebrate the day of uh, uh, remembrance and reconciliation. So Ukraine still divided on, the, on their attitudes towards these events and to these dates. I dare say that it can be said that uh, we have well different we have differences, but in case of the majority of countries located between Russia and Germany, most countries would consider that date to be um, a different in approach. Now, uh, Professor Nikshantaitis mentioned the Ribbentrop-Molotov uh, Pact and the Hitler-Stalin, or the Hitler-Stalin Pact, that is the um, alternative, alternative name for the same pact, uh, not to mention the different approaches to the occupation of the Lithuanian states in, in 1940 and 1944. So the different awareness uh, of uh, Central and Eastern Europe, does it, uh, has it impacted um, the international West European historical discourse or over the uh, 45 years of communism, obviously in case of Ukraine that period is longer, but um, has over all these years our perspective, has it disappeared from the Russian or Soviet perspective, but don't you think it has also be disappeared in Western historiography? Uh, that is a question to all the gentlemen. Uh, Mr. Łukasz Kamiński, first. Um, I think that if we uh, compare the two periods, uh, this period and period 30 years ago, we are definitely going to notice a change in West European historiography to an ever greater extent the uh, Central European experience is definitely um, recognized. For example, consider Timothy Snyder and Bloodlands. Uh, he, dis he introduced the disparity to uh, the, the consciousness, the awareness of uh, historians from both parts of Europe. But there is definitely a, dis a difference there. On the one hand, we have uh, the, the, the extent to which we absorb that particular uh, narrative depends on uh, which historians we talk to. Uh, those who are uh, focused on the on analyses of the socialist period have a tendency to focus on developments 
as a result of which uh, a vast majority of Central Eastern Europe had actually been subject to the USSR. And they actually, it, they find it much easier to reject the concept, uh, concept of liberation and they usually and they usually perceive Central and Eastern Europe as a monolith, whereas historians of World War II have a greater tendency to differentiate between the status of different countries and states and governments during World War II, and they do not have such a uniform approach, thanks to which they are also more greatly inclined to pay attention to the actual fate of individual nations. Now. Generally speaking, however, 30 years later, uh, things have definitely improved. But let me remind you uh, of my point of departure. Many European countries uh, are still in debate because we have not uh, developed uniform uh, definitions ourselves. Professor Nixon-Taitis. Uh, to follow up on what Professor Kraminski said, uh, this is a special um, circumstance, a special situation of Lithuania and perhaps the other Baltic states. Lithuanian for a uh, the thing is that Lithuanian historiography has to be read in the West. In 1998, there was an international commission of historians to uh, study Nazi atrocities as well as Soviet uh, crimes, which included a lot of well-known historians from around the world. And this was a very good instrument for uh, Lithuanian historians to establish uh, contacts uh, to cooperate with colleagues in the West. And one example that comes to mind about the way Lithuanian historiography was seen, there was an interesting debate about three years ago in London with representatives of different organizations uh, and Lith and the Lithuanian historiogra historiography was accused that it doesn't pay enough attention to uh, the Holocaust. And a lot of well-known colleagues from uh, the UK uh, stood up and pointed out uh, quoting examples of what Lithuanian historiography had done in this uh, field. When uh, speaking about the familiarity with, uh, of, uh, with the works of Lithuanian historians, uh, generally, it has to do with the way uh, the work of uh, historians is uh, received, the response to the uh, work of historians, not just in the West, but also inside a given country. There are uh, different instruments for uh, dissemination of uh, knowledge about what historians had already achieved. Uh, Professor Lev and the entire institute in Darmstadt uh, have uh, done quite a lot uh, to uh, promote uh, knowledge of Polish history in Germany. And so how can this uh, Polish and Central European uh, perspective be uh, presented in the West? Would the experience of the Institute be of any help? Uh, the founder of the Institute, uh, Karl Didatius, uh, was a translator. And one of the first anthologies of uh, poems he translated into the late 1950s or early 60s was an anthology of young Polish writers uh, who were killed during World War II and uh, whose uh, poems uh, addressed or spoke about uh, wartime experience. Uh, so this uh, subject matter was present in Germany and continues to be so. If uh, previously you asked, you asked about uh, historiography, and uh, historiography can uh, be split up into a number of uh, topics. We have uh, a purely scientific academic uh, historiography. There is close cooperation between German-speaking historians and Polish uh, and uh, other uh, Central European or Eastern European historians. This is going very well. There are many publications, and a lot is being done. And so we could say that we have uh, a very good uh, 
knowledge of the um, field and circumstances in Central Europe, and we are very much aware of the uh, specific uh, historic experience. The second is the middle layer, uh, popular um, science or popular history. Uh, books and the media. This is very important. I took a look at uh, how many books are on sale in uh, Germany uh, with uh, the title Zweite Weltkrieg, about 10,000 uh, books. Uh, you can order uh, about uh, 10,000 books uh, which uh, deal with World War II in Germany. So this is a lot. Uh, but here we have a problem because most often these uh, books uh, deal with very specialized uh, questions or mm, Central and Eastern Europe uh, is only a fraction, only part. They deal with military history and uh, as well as the German experience uh, largely. The third um, layer, the third is uh, education, uh, the younger generation and uh, perhaps this is the most important possibility to teach and to provide at least some knowledge. Uh, and here, Central and Eastern Europe is practically not mentioned, is overlooked. Uh, there is the um, September campaign, the invasion of Poland. Then we have Operation Barbarossa, the invasion of the Soviet Union. We have the Holocaust. Uh, distrust in school books, uh, but everything uh, apart, aside from these uh, huge, these uh, major events is uh, practically overlooked and there's a lot uh, that we can do. There's a lot of catching up to do. We uh, lack uh, symbols uh, centrally, for instance. Our institute has uh, mm, said that there is the need to uh, erect a uh, monument in Berlin to uh, Polish victims. Will that monument be uh, erected? Will that Will that we'll see that remains to be seen. Uh, it's uh, being uh, discussed. Um, discussions are underway. Some persons are seeing that we can't see it, see the victims in terms of their nationality, because they're saying, why should we commemorate just the Poles and not the, all the other victims of World War II? There are others who say that you have to start somewhere. You have to sow that uh, Poland is our uh, largest neighbor, and we have this obligation to commemorate, we to uh, show that we do remember and uh, show that we're ready in the future to remember and to uh, study, to explore the Polish experience during World War II, to analyze that experience. But it all needs to be done in a comparative perspective, bearing in mind the terror, the atrocities, bearing in mind the uh, German war crimes during World War II. I think that's about it, uh, Professor. A question to Professor Krasyanov. Ukraine <laughs> is in the uh, specific uh, unique uh, situation in Central and Eastern Europe, uh, historical situation that is, because uh, Ukraine was part of the Soviet Union for much longer, or at least Eastern and Central Ukraine than, for instance, the Baltics were. It was much longer, for much longer time, it was uh, subordinated to the Soviet Union than Poland was. On the other hand, it seems that today, as a remedy to offset the uh, communist ideology, the totalitarian period, uh, there's an increasing popularity of a nationalist uh, point of view in historiography, apotheosis of the Ukrainian insurgent army, for instance. Uh, so do you think that there is a middle ground, a middle way uh, for historiography that uh, doesn't uh, fall into the trap of glorifying either communism or extreme nationalism that might lead or has in the past led to atrocities? Great. Uh, generally, I would say that um, uh, the stream of historiography you've just mentioned, the Oun uh, Upa uh, historiography and uh, uh, representations in public space, they are, uh, well, we should not uh, overestimate their popularity and their influence on historiography. It is closer uh, to the politics and 
politics of memory and to the politics of state institutions like uh, in the Ukraine Institute of National Remembrance, at least until uh, recently. So uh, it is a mix of historiography. Uh, I would call this party historiography because it's uh, absolutely apologetic in sense of uh, promotion of uh, uh, extremely positive image of UPA and OUN. Uh, so uh, it is not uh, historiography in sense of scholarship. It is very it has few of scholarship as such in uh, its writings. Uh, we have uh, we do have a very good level uh, professional scholarship, but it is not so broadly and intensively represented in public space. So uh, we have uh, well quite considerable number of uh, uh, scholars who do research in. Um, uh, at, at very uh, at, at very good uh, level, conceptual level. For instance, we have research on collaboration um, in Ukraine. We have a, a research, a good level researches in uh, the field of everyday life during occupation. We have a, a works on occupation itself, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, I would say that uh, Soviet-style historiography of big war, uh, war of big fronts, of uh, huge war, uh, of course now it's relatively weak and uh, it's almost uh, invisible. Uh, however, um, we have a kind of contradiction between, uh, between professional historiography and the representations of professional historiography and its achievements and uh, uh, I would say a uh, state commission, what, what state wants to or wanted uh, from historians. Um, so uh, the uh, very well known anecdote about uh, uh, UPA soldiers who uh, wash their uh, <clears throat> feet in, uh, uh, in Berlin. Uh, so of course it is a kind of extreme uh, and it's not it's not historiography as such if we if we speak about scholarship. Another very important topic which appeared relatively recently in our scholarship about Second World War is Holocaust. And here we have have real problems not not with the level of scholarship uh, because uh, well generally works on Holocaust <clears throat> written by scholars are fine. But we have a real, really great problem with uh, internalization of Holocaust in public space and public uh, perceptions. Uh, still, it is presented and uh, as a part of agenda which is not Ukrainian, because uh, Ukrainian historiography and Ukrainian history, generally, uh, uh, mostly, if we speak about dominant narrative, it's. Uh, ethnocentric. So it is the history of Ukraine, the history of ethnic Ukrainians. So Holocaust is not properly appropriated and internalized in Ukrainian history, in Ukrainian memory politics and Ukrainian historiography. And uh, of course, uh, the problem you have uh, mentioned, the problem of uh, over representation of UN UPA, of course, it's part of uh, recent state politics. I hope now it's uh, over, but uh, I don't know it. We, we will see what would happen next. And uh, of course, this, uh, uh, this trend of, I would say, politics of history. I don't want to call this historiography. Uh, of course, this trend uh, heavily influences our relationship with neighbors. Uh, so. Um, I think that uh, in the nearest future, probably we will have opportunity to discuss this really at the level of professional historians, not uh, at the level of historians who deal uh, with mostly with the politics of history, not scholarship. I think that from a Polish standpoint, what uh, is what was most felt by uh, Poles was that Poland was the first to fight. That Poland was the first to put up a resistance to resist uh, Hitler. But uh, Poland became, in a way, a victim of World War II. 
In that, in Tehran, Yalta, and Potsdam, the fate of Poland was determined uh, over our heads. And uh, Poland, even though it had one of the, uh, it had the fifth uh, largest uh, allied army, Polish uh, troops uh, could not uh, take part in the victory parade in London in 46, could not celebrate with the other nations, could not celebrate the victory. So is this a uh, standpoint, is this a point of view that uh, people are aware of uh, elsewhere, or is this just a Polish uh, standpoint that is a particular, that is not uh, reflected or understood abroad? Uh, yes, I do believe that this matter has already been uh, mentioned and dealt with not only by Polish historians, uh, but also in the context of social interest, uh, or public interest, or remembrance, if you will. Uh, it is quite symbolic that the Polish troops had not been part of the victory parade in London. Uh, taking a close look at social media, it becomes apparent that people care. Uh, so, uh, well, uh, this is particularly important in view of the fact that the 8th of May is particularly important to the UK. To Great Britain. So we might well ask what kind of changes have been imposed on remembrance. In all probability, the fact that many Polish immigrants had gone to the UK had also influenced the overall situation. Nonetheless, obviously, circumstances vary depending on the country we're talking about. Many societies uh, throughout Europe, but also in the US, the Polish specificity is uh, a th thing that is quite surprising, uh, that uh, people wonder why do Poles demand to be recognized since they were naturally part of the Allied forces uh, camp or block. And so, so some people have an issue with understanding the Polish is a problem with the, with the, with the topic. Uh, but uh, once we read more about 1945, uh, we learn, we understand more. Poles had a sense of something of uh, a bitter victory, specifically those um, Polish people who were in a refuge abroad. For example, uh, Polish troops who stayed abroad uh, claimed that, yes, they um, understand uh, why British or U.S. troops are so happy, but they have a, they had an issue with experiencing the same kind of joy because they were very much aware of what was going on in Poland. I think that uh, should Polish specificity be um, enjoy greater comprehension, this is a task to be handled not necessarily by historians, but possibly by people of culture. Once a good book is written or a good movie is made, uh, that will definitely be a much better measure to uh, make un people understand. I think that uh, this merits a discussion we had last uh, year. Um, in 2019, Vladimir Putin uh, tried to assign all blame to Poland for perpetrating World War II. So my question would be, uh, how, what, uh, what is the perspective of, um, from, our, from the viewpoint of our um, foreign friends, uh, Professor Lev? Well, yes, obviously I watched the debate. I was very astonished and also I was kind of terrified. Uh, that uh, the Putin-style policy could be so strongly focused on anti-Polish politics. Nonetheless, I think that German public opinion is not necessarily very much aware of the Russian um, 
discourse, and I don't think that they are very much aware of what had been going on uh, with Poland during and after World War II. And I don't think that anybody ponders uh, or deliberates whether that uh, Poland had been liberated or occupied. Um, from the viewpoint of uh, relatively well-educated Germans, uh, people, well, uh, World War II had expanded beyond Germany, obviously, and uh, a, an um, average uh, educated uh, uh, German understands that Poland was simply one of the many countries affected. Um, obviously, different countries may be considered Greece or France or North uh, um, Africa or the Balkans or Ukraine or or the Balkan uh, states, and uh, that same average educated German can also consider Poland. We also have the generation gap to uh, consider. Um, we, you also have to understand that Germany has 25% of migration population. And uh, these people don't even consider themselves to be part of the um, memory or remembrance chain, if you will, linking them to the past. So I think that this is another factor to be considered. There is one other thing uh, to be considered. Uh, it would be important for Poland, Lithuania, and Ukraine should take action to uh, make Germany uh, and other partners realize uh, what the burden of the war was. But uh, you should not be crass about it. In uh, Poland, um, you can show people a symbol uh, and talk about it in the context of some kind of historical campaign. But in Germany, you have to have a different approach. You have to take a different approach. You have to use symbols and uh, discourses to adapt them to the German discourse. discourse. Because in Germany, be it politicians, be it historians, uh, have something of an allergic reaction to um, to the discourse. So it is quite different. It is much easy. It is much better to work on a comparative basis. It is much easier to point to individual experience. And uh, in uh, comparison with, uh, and it is, it would be much better to to make the German population understand that this was our experience. We know that this was your experience. So a comparative approach would be much better. And I think that this is the only way to reach uh, the uh, broadly understood German population. Professor Kasyanov. Follow this discussion, and uh, I have a sense that. Uh, this discussion lasts not, not since September 2019, when the European Parliament uh, adopted resolution, well-known resolution, to which uh, Putin reacted in December. Uh, I think that the, the whole thing lasts from uh, at least 2005, when there was a first uh, uh, clash between Russia and uh, Eastern European countries exactly after the uh, extension of NATO and, uh, um, uh, and Europe. Uh, so it is a long story, and uh, it, is, it, it is not resolved. It will, will not be resolved, I believe, because uh, for Russia, uh, the myth of the great victory is a constitutive myth. It is very important uh, in terms of uh, securing uh, the internal unity in Russia, representing this myth as a uh, uniting myth, as a kind of uh, thing which uh, uh, provides cohesion, internal cohesion. Uh, it, this myth is also important in terms of influence on uh, uh, near abroad, uh, particularly on Ukraine, of course. So it is a part of this irredentist uh, politics, uh, external politics of uh, a Russian state, of the Russian state. So uh, definitely uh, they respond, Putin responds uh, in, uh, in this very aggressive manner. And uh, uh, so he, uh, it's, it's one of the tactics of relativization of uh, 
um, of, of, of the fact that uh, Molotov Ribbentrop Pact was between two countries. Uh, so, in a broader context, uh, in, the, in, in purely, let's say, or probably narrower context, in the context of uh, professional historiography, uh, we do not have discussions on this matter. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, Ukraine presented in official politics of memory as a, well, mostly as a victim of two totalitarian regimes uh, and their uh, fight for um, uh, world dominance. So uh, uh, we, we do not have, a, we didn't have any uh, visible or, uh, or important public discussion about what is happening now between Russia and uh, Europe. We had some, uh, uh, some reflections in, <laughs> sorry for mentioning this, in Facebook and uh, in uh, some media. But generally, uh, I see no traces of, uh, of real uh, discussion in terms of uh, values, in terms of uh, approaches, and in terms of, uh, well, further uh, elaboration of this of this topic. Probably it is too fresh uh, to reflect upon this at the level of professional historiography. Nevertheless, uh, Ukraine at this moment belongs to the Eastern European model of public memory. So uh, it is definitely uh, what Putin said and what Putin promotes at international level as a um, their system of value and attitudes to the uh, Second World War and how it would, would be uh, uh, interpreted. Of course, it is not accepted here in Ukraine. Panie profesorze, pro, uh, uh, Professor Nikshantaitis, I believe that Lithuanians, similarly to Poles, are deeply convinced that their point of view is uh, very poorly visible. Is that true? And uh, what does Lithuania, or what, what do Lithuanians do in order to make themselves heard? It goes without saying uh, that uh, the point of view of Lithuanians and their historians is uh, quite similar to what is going on in the West. And we are very much aware that what we need is international cooperation. Only international cooperation can give rise to answers which may prove very, very interesting and important in the context of contemporary history, including the history of Lithuania throughout Europe as well. But if I may, I would like to mention one other thing very briefly. I would like to say a couple of words about how Lithuania reacted to uh, what Putin said. I was asked why we did not react. Well, my personal response was that historians tend not to respond to stupidity. Nonetheless, we are very much aware that there are certain schemas, there are certain patterns that uh, Putin follows. And even in the most recent declarations of the Lithuanian Seim, or Seimas, we have been referencing uh, that particular uh, schema or s n comments made by the Russian party. And that also affects uh, the overall attitude of Lithuanian politicians. Well, we are very much aware that the Polish and Lithuanian take on history is um, closer and closer, and the Museum of Polish History is cooperating very closely with the Institute of um, History in uh, Vilnius. Obviously, that is not only to our credit, that is definitely to the credit of politicians who have been doing whatever they could to uh, improve our, um, well, the many facets of our cooperation. We are slowly but surely approaching the end of this panel, but also the end of the conference. I would like to start by thanking 
all the speakers who accepted our invitation. I would like to use this opportunity and thank all the viewers, all the, our audiences who are listening in via Facebook and other uh, media. I would also want to encourage those who have not watched the entire conference and would like to relive previous comments and previous panels uh, to uh, take a closer look at the conference, to view the conference in its entirety on the websites of all our partners. That is the European Network, Remembrance and Solidarity, uh, the um, Museum of Second World War and the Polish uh, Russian Cooperation Institute. I would like to thank our partners for their cooperation. I do believe that this conference has provided us with food for thought, food for interesting thought, I dare say, uh, even if we had not managed to uh, mention everything we wanted to, we would have wanted to, it will definitely become food for thought for future meetings. I would also want to um, encourage Polish viewers to switch their TV sets on at 5.55 p.m. Um, and tune in to the TVP Historia channel.